Hi, it's Dave. So I wanted to celebrate the announcement that Tesla will be included in the S&P 500. So I called up Rob Maurer from Tesla Daily. I'll link to his YouTube channel where he covers the daily Tesla news. I've known Rob for many years and it's always great to catch up and share our latest Tesla musings. All right, uh, today we are here with Rob Maurer from Tesla Daily. I wanna welcome you. Hey Rob, how's it going? Hey Dave, thanks for having me. Hey, yeah, I, I wanted to reach out because um, you know, Tesla has um, is set to join the S and P five hundred. It's been a long journey, and I wanted just to kind of celebrate with you. <laughs> Perfect, <laughs> let's do it. Yeah, I mean, I figured like you know, um, Rob, you're one of those guys who's like he's gone through the ups and downs with Tesla, as many other shareholders have, and owners and That's employees true. as well. But um, yeah, it's like I, I realized like it's been a long journey. It has been. Yeah. I mean, I first invested back in 2013. So coming up on eight years now, I think in the spring, um, I sort of first invested after that hu first first huge spike up to like $100 per share, obviously pretty split. And yeah, like you said, been through been through the ringer, been through margin calls, been through the good times and the bad. So That's nothing compared to the actual workforce of Tesla. But yeah, mm -hmm. I think all investors that have been with Tesla for a while can kind of relate to the the highs and the lows. Yeah, like, um, yeah, the employees for one, I'm like, yeah, they deserve like so many shout outs, you know, just the yeah. amount of focus, energy, just the dedication, the problem solving, you know, they're, they're having to do day in and day out. It's just amazing. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think um, when I was thinking about the S&P 500, I'm like, you know, it's there's been a lot of new investors obviously over the past you know year or so as the stock price has gone up and and people think Tesla's de-risked, but I remember back like man there were a lot of times where it just felt like you know Tesla was on the ground and people the media and FUD and disinformation was just like pounding Tesla while they're <laughs> on the ground you know and yeah. as a tes Tesla shareholder it just felt like so painful um and um, i mean that's kind of why yeah. i started doing tesla daily is because back in 2017 every other day there would be an article on you know cnbc new york times whatever it was that was just you know either blatantly incorrect or just missing so much context like a great example is the tesla fires you know back when they had there were there was a string of a week where there were like three battery fires that happened in a row and everyone just kind of piled on the stock dropped you know 20 30 percent i think and it was just like, okay, if you actually look at the data here, battery electric vehicles are much safer from a, a fire perspective than internal combustion engine cars are. There just happen to be a lot of Teslas out there now, and some of them are starting to catch on fire in an accident, not mm -hmm. just randomly in an accident. So, but if you look at the data, it's it's no big deal. So, just trying to get stuff like that across to people was was really the essence of you know the start of it. And it's just all part of that high and low that we've that we've all been through, and I think. You know, over the last couple of years, we've definitely seen a shift where I think Tesla's gotten back up off the ground and started to take control of that narrative, which has been great. Um, yeah, it's interesting because, like, I think in some ways, both of us might have, like, some reason to thank the FUD because just like it gave you motivation to start kind of, you know, not just not necessarily defending Tesla per se, but like getting accurate information out. Right. Like it was, I think, very similar to me, like back in the day, I was like you know, researching Tesla on Tesla Motors Club and sharing. But then when I started to see all this FUD out there, I'm like, man, this is so crazy. It's like the dominant narrative out there is just so shallow. It's so reactionary. It's so just um, narrated by people who don't even understand the company. And right. actually, I started a, a newsletter, email newsletter called Tesla Weekly. This is back like in 2014 or or 15, I ran it for about three years and I, I got to about three or 4,000, you know, subscribers. And every week I would um, highlight the week's uh, best news from the best sources and kind of give my take on it because I felt like without a filter, people are just like, you know, just getting this unfiltered, just biased media. And, and oftentimes in our society, it's like whoever can speak the loudest and the most often, you know, gets the most, you know, attention and, and, and buy-in. And so in some ways, like, you know, our channels are in some way kind of a response in, to some degree, you know, um, to a lot of the FUD and to a lot of the, in a way, it was an injustice in a way where you have this great company, um, fundamentally they're, you know, 
addressing a huge market, they have this breakthrough product with the Model S coming up with the Model 3. This is back in the day, of course. And they're executing like on all cylinders. They're doing making all the right moves, yet the whole media and the whole narrative is this is like a sucker company, right? <laughs> um, and uh, it's it's just a fascinating yeah history or you know background of of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, no, it, it really has been crazy and just like it was such a long period of time. Like you had that initial excitement in 2013, and then it just stagnated for five six years pretty much before you know the last year. And over that period of time, Tesla made so much progress. Like they went from I think like 20,000 deliveries in 2013 up to you know. 200,000 plus by the time the stock really started to respond and obviously a lot of that you know was seeming to be priced in Tesla did carry a high valuation for its revenue and obviously for its lack of profit but uh, you know you can just see the potential and I think a lot of people I think we're really fortunate that there's been this community around Tesla of just so many incredibly smart people and it's very unique to find that and so many people like passionate about the company and about the stock and about doing research on it and all sharing that all sharing all those ideas. Um, so I think, you know, we're lucky to have been a part of that, but it's really, you know, it's not just the YouTubers. It's like you said, Tesla Motors Club Forum. It's like out there, you know, all, all, all the blogs that have covered Tesla, like Tesla Roddy Electric, you know, people have different feelings on those, but you, there's been so much of a groundswell of just trying to get good information out there that you don't really see a lot. And I think a lot of that has to do with just Tesla's mission of, you know, we're going to actually try to do something good in the world rather than just make a profit. And, you know, by the way, the side effect of doing that is, you know, we, we might become one of the biggest companies in the world someday. So it's just been, you know, a super fascinating story. And um, like you said, I think we're, we're fortunate enough to have found it and to have been involved in it and had that time to make, you know, investments over a period of years before sort of all that recognition happened. Yeah, definitely. Um, like oftentimes like, you know, Elon Musk might refer to like the, the pain of kind of the shorts or people actually betting against the company when they're trying to do something good. And I think more recently I've been kind of getting in touch with that, that pain or just that kind of, um, and it, right now it's kind of, you know, kind of moot in the sense of, there's been some escape philosophy in terms of Tesla's financial situation. But like a few years ago in 2017, 2018, when there was a lot of, you know, anxiety and a lot of unclear things in Tesla's future, their valuation did matter. You know, it mattered if, te if there was a FUD campaign that affected the perception of their suppliers toward them and the investors toward them it affects what they can borrow and just it affects a lot of stuff actually that people probably don't realize how much it does. And I think Elon is very was very in touch with that, like how much of a negative impact um, the FUD, the media, et cetera, is having on his company while he's like probably doing the most ambitious and the most um, tactical move to help the planet and climate, right? And it's just like, for so many years, like no, not many people got that. No, not many people understood that this is what Tesla is really trying to do. They're really trying to change the world. And now that, you know, there's been some escape momentum and stuff, people are saying, wait a minute. Yeah, Tesla might actually really change the world. What were these people thinking, you know, a few years ago? <laughs> it's like so crazy. I can't imagine how frustrating that has got to be because it's just like you're in this position and you're trying to do this ridiculously challenging thing to help people. And then people are sitting there like throwing rocks at you, like saying, stop it, stop it. Like you're, you're terrible. You're just trying to trick, like trying to trick us. It's just such a ridiculous situation. And you know, I get it. You, you gotta be skeptical and you gotta do your research and stuff. But I think anyone that has spent, you know, a significant amount of time doing the research, you know, understanding Elon's background, understanding just where he comes from and what he aspires to do. Like you just, <laughs> that takes away those rocks. Like you don't need to throw those rocks anymore. It's just, it's, it's just so wild I, and I can't imagine how hard that has been. Yeah, definitely. Like I feel some type of like um, camaraderie or kind of a forever, forever camaraderie with, with those shareholders and employees who've gone through like the really tough times of Tesla, you know, and have really like internalized it over the years and to see kind of the breakthroughs that have happened over the past, you know, year or so. And to see finally there's a sense of, uh, acceptance, no matter how reluctant that acceptance might be, there's finally kind of a recognition that Tesla is 
an important company. And they might disagree on the exact valuation to give Tesla and if it's really worth whatever 400 or plus a billion dollars. But I think there's a general perception shift that happened this past year, which is Tesla is no longer a scrappy startup um, that's about to die. But now that Tesla, like the question is, how much will tes Tesla change the world, right? It's a question more of the impact of this kind of world changing company. Yeah, and I think not even so much a question of like how much Tesla will change the world, but how much of from a market perspective and a media coverage perspective, like how much of that value comes back to Tesla? Because I think, you know, whether Tesla ends up dominating or whether all the other automakers are upstarts, you know, wherever they come from, China, America, Germany, wherever, I think it's clear that the direction is now electric versus even two or three years ago. I think there was still a lot of uncertainty, but now you have pretty, pretty much every automaker that <laughs> is worth talking about, talking about how they're heading towards you know, a fully electric future uh, at some point, kind of as soon as they can. So, you know, whether Tesla ends up justifying a, a $400 billion market cap or a $4 trillion market cap someday, I think, you know, we've seen the shift, we've seen the inflection point where really what Tesla's doing with their mission is going to come to fruition. It's just a matter of how quickly and how much of that, you know, is Tesla driven versus is people following Tesla? Yeah, I think one of the kind of underappreciated or often overlooked kind of amazing things that Tesla has done in the past 10, 10 years is not just making an amazing EV with the Model S, X, Model 3, Model Y, etc. But they did something which I think most companies in their situation wouldn't be able to do. And what that is, is they caught the next big thing, which was autonomous driving. Like they were able to not just get stuck as an EV manufacturer, etc. But Elon and his team start to say, hey, wait a minute, there's something actually maybe bigger than even the EV transformation. It's the autonomous tr transformation where, where people aren't even going to drive their cars anymore themselves. And moving from the concept of a car as a vehicle that you drive and moving it to this concept of a robot that the computer is driving. And that transition, I think, is radically different than the whole entire paradigm of the auto industry. And as an EV maker, you're stuck in the auto paradigm mentality. But for Elon and his team to break out of that and say, wait a minute, we have to disrupt ourselves. It's like the innovators dilemma in some ways. Like you have to change your identity to say we're not a e we're not an automaker anymore. We're, you know, a maker of robots that are going to be driven by computers and we need to invest heavily, even though we're not going to find the the fruit of our labor until many years down the road. And for Tesla, even while they're struggling to ramp their EV products to invest so heavily in autonomous driving, get the best researchers, the best AI minds in the world, you know, build hardware, you know, to collect data and to push forward, even though like, you know, they're still struggling ramping the, their EV cars. It's like, that's really, and not just that, then they go into batteries too, right? And they, they go, hey, we need to disrupt the whole battery industry too. And it's like, yeah, in a lot of ways, Tesla has surpassed my expectations, you know, of of what they could do. Like when I was first looking at the company in 2012 or so, I don't know. How, how about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would completely agree. I think, you know, to your point, that just adds more cost, more complexity to really like what the fundamental purpose of Tesla was, which was just to, you know, get more electric vehicles out there. But I think Elon saw like, OK, this is happening and this is going to be this is going to be a way that we can drive that forward even, you know, faster or even better, or even longer versus just trying to make, you know, good electric vehicles. And I think a lot of people at the time where they sort of unveiled autopilot didn't really make that connection. I probably didn't make that connection all that quickly either. I think it was back in, it was either 2016 or 2017 where it was like the famous unveil the D event where they unveiled like the dual motor, uh, drivetrain for the model S and, Elon was like, we're going to unveil the D and then something else. And the something else was autopilot. And I, you know, it wasn't even like the headliner of that event, but that's, you know, that's the transformational element that we've seen certainly from a stock perspective over the, you know, the last couple of years, Tesla wouldn't carry this valuation if they were just putting electric vehicles out on the road, maybe they'd be a hundred billion dollar valuation or something like that. But having the ability to send, sell a $10,000 option on your car to some people that's completely software and completely going to fall to the bottom line, you know, for the most part, that's what transforms the valuation. And that's what allows Tesla access to all this capital, great interest rates on debt. It changes so much for the business that actually now, because they made those hard investments early on, they're already reaping those benefits, even though they haven't really fully 
achieve that full autonomous uh, vision yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally see that because like, imagine if Tesla was like second or third place with autonomous driving was like in terms of like, they don't really have hardware on their cars yet. They're just kind of testing it out in the, in the labs, etc. <laughs> you know, and it's like, they're not in a dominant position, let's say, you know, in the future of autonomous driving, this is it, that would be a different company, you know, very much. Yeah, it, it's like, I don't know if people completely appreciate how much, how profound, you know, the autonomous driving kind of future is and how wide open and how big that market is. Because a lot of it has been happening under the cover. It hasn't been like this. I mean, there was autonomy day, sure. But um, in some ways, Tesla hasn't touted it as much as they could, you know, their autonomous driving features. And they've been kind of like heads down. We're going to solve this problem. And and because of that, I think it's like, it's still, I think, going to be surprising for most people to see what happens over the next 10 years in terms of autonomous driving. Yeah, I think even over the next couple of years, it's going to be surprising for people because, at least for investors, because what I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate right now is how much of an impact the deferred revenue that you know Tesla has from the sale of the full self-driving option how big of an impact that's actually having on their financials in terms of sort of suppressing um, the the bottom line and the operating income that Tesla has right now. You know, last quarter in Q3, they generated an, a 9% operating um, margin, which that's boosted by uh, regulatory credit sales, of course, but it's also being suppressed by, number one, Elon's compensation package, which is a little bit outsized right now as Tesla achieves, a, you know, a lot of these tranches of his compensation package sort of all at once. Um, so that's suppressing it. But then you also have this deferred revenue from um, the full self-driving option, which Tesla can't recognize all that until they deliver all those features. And even then they still have to defer some of the revenue because they're selling it upfront for the life of the vehicle. So they need to recognize it over time because they need to continue to deliver, you know, that as a service. So that's something that doesn't get reflected in the financial results today. And even without that being reflected, Tesla is still generating, you know, basically industry leading operating margin before they're even at scale. Like we saw 140,000 deliveries in Q3 this next quarter, we're going to see, you know, in my estimation, probably somewhere around 200,000, it's going to be a, a significant jump again from Q3. And that's just going to drive that operating leverage even further. And that's again, before factoring in, this all this deferred revenue that Tesla's got. So once they deliver what they're doing in the full self-driving beta right now to more customers, that's going to come through in a really significant way. And I think a lot of people are going to be, you know, frankly, a little bit shocked by that because they don't dig into these details and they don't understand those things just by looking at, you know, the, the CNBC report or whatever other, you know, earnings recap they're seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I totally um, see that. Um, so Rob, I, my camera, I, like we're, we're having some technical difficulties, my battery or something is going in and out. So I, I have a ton of actually the topics to talk to you about. I mean, I want to get your opinion on full self-driving beta, um, how it rolls out to full featured into robo taxi. I want to get into kind of, um, production and deliveries, not just for next quarter for just next year, how you see kind of next year's product lineup in terms of Cybertruck and semis and Berlin. Um, I want to know why you got a model three and not a model Y. Um, I want to know what your, the, the most exciting thing you see for Tesla in 2021 is, but also what the most, the biggest risk you see for Tesla in 2021. Um, and yeah, I have some more profound questions to ask you too, um, in terms of kind of what's next, what's Tesla's next big leap forward like what is it that's going to propel them to this next stage you know um into millions millions of cars and so i think what we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to wait uh for uh part two of this we're gonna teaser <laughs> exactly <laughs> i'm gonna reach out to you robin about a week or two this week i'm actually camping out in a um, going to Joshua Tree National Park it has like zero nice. internet for like a few days, but so I'll, I'll reach out to you um, in a week or two, and then we'll set up something else, and hopefully we can uh, dive into some of these more juicy <laughs> topics. But most of all, I just wanted to celebrate and uh, just you know, um, yeah, just just enjoy the moment together, you know. Um, yeah, and, so it's a big moment. It's been a long time coming, and I think you know, as we said at the beginning, 
you know, all credit to Tesla, to Elon, to all the employees, to all the, you know, investors that have, you know, been been with the company for, for so long and been so supportive. Yeah, definitely. All right, Rob, we'll take care. See you a bit. All right. I was good to talk to you. Thanks. Okay. Dave. All right. Bye. I hope that was helpful. I'm curious to hear from you. If you are a Tesla shareholder, what are you most excited about for 2021? And what do you think is Tesla's biggest risk factor for 2021? My next interview will be Galileo Russell from HyperChange, and I reached out to him to hear his thoughts on the S&P 500 inclusion and also about Tesla's plans in 2021 and beyond. Consider liking this video to help spread the word and also subscribing to my channel to keep updated. We're looking at investment topics from different angles, trying to pry and get beneath the surface of things. All my YouTube videos are also available as an audio podcast. Just search for Dave Lee on investing on your favorite podcast player. I'm also active on Twitter at HeyDave7. I'm grateful for all your support and we'll see you in my next video. Thanks.